My name is Samuel Elisha Johnson. I was born in November the 6th, 1932, in the state of Mississippi. My father's name was uh, John William Johnson, and uh, my mother's name was Lucille Johnson. When my dad married her, uh, they they both give their hearts to the Lord very young in their life, and uh, they had three children. I was the youngest. Evelyn was the oldest. Marsha was the next. My dad was, uh, he was a, a farmer before they got married, and uh, then after, but soon after they got married, he gave his heart to the Lord, uh, he received a call to preach the gospel. So he uh, uh, began to preach at an early age. He was uh, baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ in the early 20s. And he started preaching somewhere around 19 and 25. Money was very, very uh, scarce during the Depression, and uh, Dad had put the roof on the house, but we didn't, we didn't, have, a, we didn't have a floor in it. Uh, but we had to move in because he was having to go a long distance to work on. And so my dad was a pastor in a place called uh, Butler uh, Community. In, uh, in Knoxville County. And uh, I do not remember much about that place because I was just a baby. But I do know that when I was born, my dad was baptizing some people uh, because someone told him while he was standing out in the water, it was a boy. <laughs> and, uh, we, we, we had to walk to a, a well, a spring, uh, down the hill to get our water. It was very good water, but uh, there was a little distance we had to go to get the water. Then my dad moved, uh, or he went, he was invited to preach for some people, and he went to a place called Noxipater, Mississippi, and he put up a brush arbor and had a revival meeting. Great crowds came and heard. They were really hungry, and a lot of people give their hearts to the Lord. There was only two churches. One was a Methodist, one was a Baptist, but they wanted to hear the true, the full gospel. They wanted him to build a church. The farmers, different farmers, donated uh, uh, the, the trees. They cut the trees, hauled the logs to the sawmill. So uh, uh, there was a man offered to saw the logs. So uh, they went out and sawed the logs out of the woods, hauled the logs to the sawmill. The sawmill saw owner, Mr. Cooper, uh, he got the men to, uh, to work free, and he said if they would work free, he would saw the logs, the lumber, free. So that's what he did. So uh, Dad built a 40 by 60 church and uh, uh, a two-bedroom parsonage with two porches uh, and was able to dig a well very close to the house. Okay, tell and, us about the Brush Arbor meetings that he would hold. Yeah, the church was started by putting up a Brush Arbor first. And of course, I was too young to remember that, but uh, I do remember them telling about it and the big, tremendous crowds they were having. But uh, some of the denominations were 
a little concerned because their people were coming and hearing uh, the full gospel. And uh, they told that uh, my dad had something he would pour on them to make them get the Holy Ghost. <laughs> and my dad said he wished he had something, but they were going to have to s repent and seek the Lord, and uh, the Lord would give them the Holy Ghost. Uh, so uh, that was uh, uh, the all the offerings that were taken during the time of the church building uh, amounted to seventy-two dollars. He built the church and the parsonage with with uh, only that much money. Tell us about uh, what your dad believed, his doctrine and his. Yeah, well, his... dad had been baptized. Uh, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, when he first gave his heart to the Lord, and uh, he was taught and he believed that there was only one God, that the Lord Jesus Christ came, was God manifested in the flesh. And he preached, uh, he preached a full gospel, believing in the baptism uh, of, the, of the Holy Spirit also. So uh, uh, it was a very strict group of people, uh, and they 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 would meet before the church about a half an hour, and the men would go outside into the woods to pray, and the women would pray in the church building before the church ever started the uh, church service ever started. But I can still remember some of those prayer meetings. They really prayed with all of their heart. My mother was, was uh, a praying woman. And uh, the first time that I remember having the Bible read, uh, I was sitting in her lap with both of the children sitting on each side, uh, the other two children. And she was reading the Bible to us. And I can remember that just like it was yesterday. Uh, but she was very strict. Uh, one time, I remember uh, I was kicking dust uh, from the road. And she told me not to do that. Said, if you do it again, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to spank you. And... Uh, I said to her, you'll have to catch me first. And I, that was the wrong word to say. She had me so quick. And uh, she found a little uh, switch uh, from a tree nearby, and I really got it very good. <laughs> One time, uh, my uncle and aunt came to visit, and we did, my mother didn't know what to cook because she didn't have anything extra at the house. So she went out in the garden and gathered some squash blooms and fried them uh, and made a nice dish out of it. My uncle said they were the best that he had ever eaten. So uh, it just shows how that we made it somehow during those very, very poor years. Uh, when she was about 30, 31 years old, she had a dream that she was going to die. And so she asked the Lord to, to uh, give her an extension of time because she wanted me to be able to remember her. And uh, so the Lord answered her prayer, but after she had three dreams, the third time she did not ask for an extension. And uh, so uh, she had a ruptured appendix and uh, didn't want to go to the hospital because she believed that the Lord had given her a dream showing his, his perfect will. And so she accepted that. And... Uh, uh, she got sick down at a neighbor's house when she was helping 
the neighbor quilt to quilt. And uh, so, uh, but I remember her very well. And I remember her praying. And uh, when the people came over to pray for her, I remember her saying, if, if I had more strength, I'd get out of this bed and just rejoice in the Lord because uh, she felt the presence of the Lord so strong. But uh, the Lord helped with the pain, but she still went to be with the Lord. Tell us about um, about growing up poor and the kind of the type of community it was, the farming and all that kind of thing. And uh, Dad, Dad uh, was able to work uh, with one of the neighbors who had a farm and horses, so. He, he was called a sharecropper, and he would uh, farm the crop, and then he would get a percentage of that which, uh, which the crop brought when it was taken to sell it. It was, uh, we always had a big garden, had chickens, so we had eggs, and usually would raise uh, some pigs, and during the fall, after it got cold, uh, there would there would be a, a time of killing the pigs, and and uh, they would uh, rub salt on the meat to preserve the meat, and then it was preserved, and they could eat on it uh, for some times. Yeah, we. Uh, I remember my mother had asked my brother and I to kill a goose because there wasn't too much to eat at that particular time. And so uh, we went out and I was supposed to hold his head uh, and my brother was going to cut its head off. So uh, he, <laughs> he didn't quite get the whole thing cut. So the poor goose jumped up and started running with his head dangling you know, just everywhere. Uh, we would go out. I can remember my mother going out uh, uh, to to look for cherry trees when the cherries would get ripe. They were just wild cherry, but she would take a fishing pole and hit the hit the tree until they would fall on a, on a sheet. She'd put a sheet on the ground and then she'd funnel them into a bucket and uh, uh, canned them so that they, we could have uh, some cherry juice during the winter time. Uh, it, it was during the Depression, so it was a very, very <laughs> poor time. Uh, we didn't know. Uh, we always had something to eat. So uh, uh, Dad, Dad uh, would also hold revivals in different places. We would have fellowship meetings there in, in it was called Hope Tabernacle. And that church, uh, you know, was there for many, many years. And after Dad moved to Louisville and started a church in Louisville, other people came and pastored Hope Tabernacle. And uh, Dad built 10 churches in his ministry uh, that I can remember. You know, we lived in a place where the wagons would come and turn down a road right in front of our house to go to get their sugar cane uh, <clears throat> made into uh, molasses. And uh, so I would go and sit on the bank and just look very, very hungry. <laughs> and uh, they would throw uh, sugar cane to me, sometime one, sometime two or three stalks. And I would go take them in the house uh, because the next wagon, uh, if they saw I had cane already, they wouldn't give me any. And I wanted to be sure and have some for my brothers. 
and sister when they got out of school. Also, uh, we were coming from a fellowship meeting uh, one time, and on the way from the church, uh, there was a man that was stopped by the side of the road who had no jack. So he stopped my dad to ask him, did he have a jack? And he said, yes, he had a jack, but he didn't have much time. He was late for the other church service we were going to, so uh, my dad just asked him to loosen the lug nuts, and uh, so he just backed up to the car, picked up the tire, the car, while the man took off the tire, put the spare tire on, and then put the lugs on, and and then he let the car back down. He would sometimes load cross ties when he worked at the railroad and uh, load them uh, on his shoulder and take them up, up the ramp uh, all alone. So he was, he was very, very strong. I give my heart to the Lord when I was five years old. And I remember that uh, very, very distinctly. Uh, there were comments uh, from part of the family that they thought I was too young. And, uh, but I, I protested their, <laughs> their argument because I really knew the Lord had heard my prayer and I felt like a different person. The first I heard about Brother Brandon was in 1946. Uh, and my dad had uh, had gone from Mississippi to take a couple over that the woman uh, had a had a health problem, and uh, they asked my dad. They didn't have a car, so they asked him, would he take them over to the meetings uh, to hear Brother Brandon preach and to get prayed for? So when Dad came back from that meeting. You know, I can remember as he began to talk about the things he saw, the things that he heard, the things that took place in the meeting. Uh, he would do that with tears in his eyes. And, uh, of course, this planted a lot of confidence in my heart. Uh, and I thought, oh, sounds like Bible days are here again. Everywhere I go, I meet people from Arkansas. It was one of my first places to go to after I left St. Louis, where we was at the Keele Auditorium and went down into Arkansas. And I'll never forget those people, how they come. Oh, just, there was 28,000 people, the newspaper said, in Jonesboro. And the city's about eight or 10,000, I guess, population. For 30 miles around the city, was nothing. All the farmhouses taken up and tents built and things and people living in it. Under old, old trucks and people raining. It'd be raining and people holding little pieces of, of canvas and newspapers or their sick folks just waiting for them to be prayed for. It didn't make any difference if they got in this week or next week. Whenever it was, it'd be all right. See, I was way out in the wilderness. I'd pull back and was back there praying alone before the service. I'd see people coming out those dusty roads, going down to the service long in the afternoon. And I noticed young ladies, beautiful young ladies, not over 16, 18 years old, packing their shoes and stockings under their arm. Before they would get there, they'd sit down, dust off their feet, and put on their holes and their shoes. They only had one pair, and it had to last. But they really loved the Lord. Some of the most outstanding miracles I have ever seen done in America was did there. And... I want to come back to Arkansas one of these days, <laughs> just have a real old time of fellowship around the Word and the people of God. And I wanted to, I wanted to uh, uh, meet Brother Branham, but I couldn't go with him because I was in school when those meetings were going on. When I give my heart to the Lord. Of course, I'd been taught that 
The baptism of the Holy Spirit is for all who repent. And uh, so uh, I sought the baptism of the Holy Spirit for a number of years, telling God, uh, if you just fill me with the Holy Spirit, I'll, I'll do anything, anything but preach, because I didn't want to be a preacher. <laughs> and uh, I never could get the Holy Spirit to come and fill me on my terms. But I do remember that one service of a brother uh, that was very uh, close to my dad and I. He called me up and asked me to go to church with him one night. And so he come by and picked me up and I went to the church and doing that song service, uh, he just stepped out and just uh, said to the whole audience, you know, without the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you're not going to be qualified for the rapture. And uh, so it just was like a, a word that went right into my heart. And I thought, well, then I'm going to get it tonight. And uh, it seemed like doubts were coming from the enemy immediately that uh, I wouldn't get it, even if I stayed all night till the sun come up. Satan said I wouldn't get it. But I had learned that he's a liar and he's the father of lies. So I told him that if I don't get it, I'll still be at the altar when the sun comes up the next morning. So I remember praying like I had never prayed before. And this time, uh, when his presence was very near and very close to me, I told the Lord, if you'll, uh, if you'll just baptize me with the Holy Spirit, I'll do anything, even preach. And as soon as I said that, there was a bright light that shined. I thought maybe someone had had uh, turned a, uh, another light on or something, but when I opened my eyes, the light went through the ceiling, through the roof. I could see the leaves of a oak tree that was leaning over the church. And uh, so I, uh, I followed that light when it passed the moon. I just said, that has to be him. And as soon as I recognized that light coming from the Lord, immediately I just began to, uh, I don't know, I don't know what I said then. I, I was totally out. <laughs> but I do know when I got through, I loved everybody. <laughs> and uh, so... I just thought, well, I had to be willing to preach, but uh, I really didn't know until I was 18 when I heard the voice of the Lord say to me, do you not know that I've called you to preach my gospel? So uh, uh, I really never wanted to be uh, a minister of the gospel. I had really thought that I would like to be an optometrist. And uh, so I wrote the school, and when the school uh, wrote me back and told me that uh, they had changed the rules, that now I had to go five years to college and to their school before I could uh, set up a practice. And uh, I was so disappointed, I began to weep. And while I was weeping in my bedroom, I, I heard an audible voice, and the, it said, Do you not know that I have called you to preach my gospel? And I said, Lord, is that you? And he spoke the same words again. And then I really began to weep. And I asked the Lord to forgive me for any doubt that I had. But I told him I wanted to really know positively and ask him to forgive me for asking for any further sign. So it seemed that in my spirit, 
uh, the question came to me, what would the Lord have to do for me to believe? So I, uh, I had to pray a little while. I didn't know what to answer. But after much prayer, uh, there were five things the Lord put in my heart to ask for. I asked, uh, we were having a convention about a month uh, from this time uh, at my dad's church about, about uh, a half a mile down the road. And uh, so uh, I asked the Lord during that convention to speak to me by tongues, by interpretation of tongues, and let me know that he was calling me uh, to, to the ministry, and then that I would never doubt him. And so I had to wait. Uh, I was working for a gasoline company, driving a gasoline truck. I asked my boss for the first two days off because I thought the Lord probably would just get it over with and call me the, the f first two days, but it didn't happen that way. And I thought I, was, I went back to work very, very uh, depressed. And uh, the boss let me have, have the time off without even asking him. And so uh, uh, then the, the next day I went back to work again and he let me off again. So I, my faith really rose. And it was the last day of the convention and uh, there were some glorious services, uh, but there had been no gifts of the Spirit, whatever. But on the last day, uh, the brother who was the head of the ABC, they called it the Associated Brotherhood of Christians, and so uh, he began to lead started the service and began to lead with just courses. And while they were singing those courses, all of a sudden it got very quiet. And there was a woman behind me that uh, began to speak in other tongues. And then she, uh, the brother that was leading the service that morning up on the platform, he gave the interpretation. And uh, but it wasn't to me, and uh, so we thanked the Lord for speaking, and then all of a sudden it got quiet again. Another message came, and I thought, well, maybe this is mine, but the message was not to me. Uh, it was to someone, but it wasn't to me. So I I just was hanging on <laughs> with all my faith that I had. So I thought maybe there will be just one more message because I knew that uh, usually there would not be over two or three messages uh, at one time because the Lord gives the preeminence to the word. So there was another message and the message was very simple and it was to me but before I heard the interpretation, while the message was coming forth in tongues, there was something jumping within my spirit. And I knew the message would be mine, but I didn't know what it was yet. But when the interpreter interpreted it, and it was very simple, and the Lord spoke to me uh, in that message, fear not that I have called you to preach my gospel. Go, and I will go with you always, even to the end of the world. And so I hit the altar <laughs> and just dedicated myself to the Lord. Now I couldn't doubt it because he had kept uh, his promise to me and uh, fulfilled my request. I... Uh, I received my call to preach in 1951, and after I did that, when I told my dad that the Lord had called me to preach, 
then he encouraged me uh, to go to Bible school. And I told him that uh, I would pray and uh, seek the Lord, that I did know precisely what the Lord wanted me to do. That very fall, uh, I went to school, to Bible school, because around home, I had to work the garden, mow the yard, work a full-time job, and uh, there wasn't much time for studying. So I thought at least if I go to school, I'll get to study more. And uh, of course, while I was in school, that's where I met my wife. Uh, we went to uh, PBI, which is Pentecostal Bible Institute, about a hundred miles north of where I lived in Tupelo, Mississippi. One of the teachers would, uh, would say uh, every year, only once or twice, but, but uh, she would say, before the Lord Jesus comes, Elijah will have to come first. And that, I'd never heard that before. But I didn't know who it was, but I, you know, I was impressed by that message. My dad called me and asked me to come home one weekend, and I asked him why. And he said that uh, Brother Branham was going to come, he said, and preach in Meridian, Mississippi, and he wanted me to come and go with him down to the last meeting. So I heard Brother Branham first in 1952. So having no vehicle, I had to get out and, and thumb a ride. But the Lord was good to me. Uh, I only got two rides. It took me all the way to my dad's house. And uh, so we went down to Meridian and uh, so uh, the brother that invited Brother Branham, the host pastor, was Brother Wes Busby. And this was in 1952. So we went down to that meeting and one of his boys became very sick during the meeting. And uh, so Brother Busby called Brother Billy Paul and said, I want to take your dad to the hotel tonight after church. So Billy said it'd be fine. So he told the boys, get in the back seat. I want to have the one that was sick to be prayed for. So they got in the back seat, and Brother Branham was just talking about the good things that God had done in different places and different meetings. And uh, then... Finally, uh, Brother Busby was thinking, I've got I've to ask him to pray for my son before I get to the uh, hotel. And uh, finally, Brother Branham uh, looked back in the back seat and said, are these your two sons? And he said, yes, sir. He said, well, I don't know whether you know it or not, but said one of them's very sick. And Brother Busby said, yes, yes, sir, I took him to the doctor today. So he said, I don't know what the doctor said, but he has a very serious rheumatic heart. And Brother Busby said, yes, sir, that's what the doctor said. Then, then he looked back and said, it's this one that's sick. And those boys were identical twins. I had known them for many years. I could never tell them apart. So when I, <laughs> when I heard that he pointed which one, I said, it has to be a prophet. He has to be a prophet to do that because I'd known them all these years and I could never uh, tell one from the other. And one of them is is now pastoring a church. Uh, whether it's the same one, you know, I, I am not positive on that. But Brother Branham preached that day on the Godhead. It was one of the best messages 
than I had ever heard. It was so simple that even a small child would be able to understand it. So I, I really appreciated that message that he preached. And uh, he, he had a high school auditorium and there were, uh, you know, it was full. It had a, it had a balcony. Uh, it was it was filled with chairs. And a tremendous crowd was there. What was your first impressions of Brother Branham in that meeting? Well, I had already, my dad had already planted faith in my heart that he was uh, a mighty man of the Lord. And uh, I was I was so happy to get to meet him and hear him back in 1952. And uh, I'll tell you, I'll never forget it as long as I live. Uh, Brother Branham would have the audience to come. Those, he would, they would give out prayer cards before the service. And then he, when he would call them to come, and stand in line, uh, you know, and uh, some people thought that his gift was not a true gift from God. Some called it mental telepathy. In fact, right here in, in uh, uh, Windsor, Ontario, uh, there was a man that wrote on a card that he had three things wrong with him. But in reality, he didn't have anything wrong with him. So when he went and stood before Brother Branham, and Brother Branham said, you don't have anything wrong with you. He said, oh, yes, I do. And then the Lord gave Brother Branham a vision, and he told him, you wrote three things on your card. None of those things were, were wrong with you. But now all three, you, you are now stricken with all three. And he went off the platform screaming for mercy in great pain and agony. That happened right here in Windsor, Ontario. So the ministry was just, it was just, he just had such a way of building faith. You know, faith comes by hearing. Hearing comes by the word of God. And the experiences that God had given him, you know, uh, built such a faith. And uh, the Lord had told Brother Branham, if you can just get people to believe that I have sent you, nothing will stand before you, not even cancer. And that's the truth. Thousands of people were healed of cancer and different things of that nature. Okay, so tell us your, tell us about meeting Norma Johnson. So, uh, uh, I remember the first time that I really noticed my wife was when she was going up to play uh, the piano for someone to sing. And uh, I thought her hair was very beautiful. Uh, and uh, so, uh, I just, you know, I watched her and I saw that she was a very uh, sincere, she, she, uh, she really seemed to love the Lord. I noticed when she'd go up to pray, uh, many of them would only stay three or four minutes, but she'd stay sometime a half an hour or longer and pray, and I liked that. And so I wanted to meet her. And uh, uh, fortunately, she, her dormitory and her room was in the next building, just next to where my dormitory was. And uh, so uh, uh, one night, uh, she told me that uh, she'd be bringing something down and leaving it at the door, at the door of the dormitory, and that I could pick it up. So when I went over there, it was two, uh, it was two uh, grilled cheese sandwiches. <laughs> uh, 
And uh, so it was one for me and one for my roommate. And uh, so uh, I just, you know, got to know her during the school year. And when the, by the time school was going to be out and she was, uh, she was going her third year, it was my first year. And so uh, I, uh, I was uh, hoping to, to get closer, but you know, when I finally told her I loved her, she told me she liked me too. <laughs> and that wasn't what I wanted to hear, but she wanted to go home and talk to her dad and her mom first. Her sister's mother-in-law was a teacher in the school, and uh, so uh, neither one of us had a car, but her, the mother-in-law took us out, you know, to a little lake where there was a boat, you know, and we got to spend some time together. Of course, she was right there with us, and she was one of the teachers, so it was no no problem at all, uh, but uh, uh, we, when we would be maybe just sitting in the in the church, uh, or sitting uh, where we'd be singing some songs, maybe I would I would find songs in the songbook that express my desire for her. <laughs> And I would show her the name of the song, <laughs> and then she would do the same thing uh, to me. So that was our way, you know, uh, of getting better acquainted. Uh, but by the time the school year was out, was I had decided I wanted her to be my wife. I had I had proposed to her before school was out but she had not given me an answer. So uh, after she talked to her dad, <clears throat> then she wrote me a letter right away. And in the letter, she said, you can come and get me. And I couldn't hardly eat that day. I was quite excited. Uh, but uh, this was uh, so, but I knew I had to ask her daddy and uh, I made a deal with her that I would ask her daddy if she would ask her mom. <laughs> and uh, so one day I thought, I got to do it today. But when I looked out the window uh, to where he was, he was under the hay baler. And I thought, well, maybe this is a good time, but no, he may get excited. And if he bumps his head, it might not work in my favor. So finally, when he got out from under the hay baler, I asked him for her hand and told her that I wanted to uh, get married. Well, he thought I was going to take her right away. And uh, so he, he cautioned that we could get in too big a hurry. And I told him, no, I was no big hurry. I, I actually was going to have to wait for the next summer to get married. And uh, so then he said, well, you don't want to wait too long. <laughs> and I knew, I knew his answer was yes when he, when he said that. Uh, so he gave me permission uh, to take her in marriage. And we got married the very following summer. Uh, I had no car to go to Idaho, and so uh, my dad took me from Mississippi uh, out to Idaho to get married. And so we asked her pastor uh, to do the ceremony, and uh, my dad also took a part for a prayer or something in the ceremony. Uh, for us, and uh, so uh, it was, uh, you know, it was a lovely wedding. We had a, a cake that had five tears on it, and uh, so uh, 
after we got married, then then we headed back uh, to Bible school. I had uh, a couple of revivals to hold uh, before school, and so her and I went back. Uh, but uh, I didn't have a car, so uh, I had asked her dad to be looking for a car, uh, and that we would be happy to make payments. So he found a, a 51 Shiva, and this was in 53. And uh, it was a very nice car, had been taken good care of. And so uh, that was the car we come back uh, for our honeymoon in. So I knew that God had called me, but I didn't know exactly where I was supposed to go. So uh, I was uh, praying with two other young men in the prayer room in 1954 in the spring. And I was praying for these two brothers that had a need. And uh, after I prayed for them, then I began to pray for what the Lord wanted me to do. And uh, so uh, as I was praying, I went into a vision and I saw a woman beyond the wall. I was kneeling not too far from the wall, but beyond that wall, north of me, she was kneeling in prayer. She was dressed in pure white, and uh, she had her hands up saying, uh, come up in an arbor and help us. Come up in an arbor and help us. So then I began to just thank him for making me know where he wanted me to go. And I started making plans to move to Ann Arbor. So my wife and I came to Ann Arbor in June of 1954, and we started looking for a building here uh, and to start a church. And okay. we found a building and rented that building and started the church. Okay.